you ready to get into the word? I want to hear what is on Rhett's heart and what, first of all, what God is doing in Rhett's life and, uh, in, and then the people that are around him and then what the Lord has put on his heart to share with us. So Rhett, you have the floor. Thank you, Dennis. Appreciate the chance to share. Um, some of you guys know me, many of you don't. Um, I'm here live from the Red Roof Inn up in Erie, Pennsylvania, as I'm on a work trip right now. Uh, I was a part of the Way International for 38 years. I just left two years ago, a little over two years ago, with a group of people that you might have heard of revival and restoration. It's just the latest wave of people who question the leadership and end up getting either booted out or walking away. We walked away. We didn't get booted. Um, it's just kind of the same old story again and again and again. Um, but the point is, after I left, I began to seek out people who had left, um, people who were of, you know, like ilk. Uh, I sought out John Nessel, John Lynn, John Shane Height, Christian Family Fellowship, and just just to see what's out there, to see who's, who's doing what and what they've learned since they left. Uh, the first book that we studied as a fellowship, because my whole fellowship left at the same time, first book we studied was John Shane Height's book on the hope. And we worked that every Tuesday night for a number of weeks, read it together, read it out loud, worked the word on it, got very, very excited about the hope. Uh, next, we did actually Old Testament history, which we did in preparation to my wife and I going on the Bible lands tour with John. And uh, Mina Hacker came there and uh, Janet was there. And I don't know if anybody else here, I don't think anybody else here was with us, but uh, it was a wonderful time of reconnection with believers and seeing what people have been doing. Uh, like I said, we have a small fellowship that I lead and get to teach the word. Uh, but one of the other things I like to do, and I started a little group called fellow laborers. So if you ever see a email coming from fellow laborers, that's me for right now. <laughs> but what it is, is uh, I try to bring in people to uh, the Pittsburgh area. We've picked out a hotel where they've got a nice big room. And so far we had a seminar on our Lord Jesus Christ with John Nessel this Ju uh, January. And then just two weeks ago, hi, Michelle. Michelle hi. was with us there in, in uh, the Holy Lands. Um, just a little over two weekends ago, we brought John Shanehite for a weekend on the hope. And uh, it was just, I just want to say the time I spent with John, I felt like I had my best friend there with me. And, um, you know, it, it had been 30 years <laughs> from the time he left the way and, and uh, I was involved when he was um, fired. <laughs> and uh, so was my brother. So I, I was very intimately knew what had happened and I reconnected with him throughout the last couple of years. And then again at, the, at our trip to uh, Israel. And then when he came, he was just the most personable down to earth guy, not just with me, but I heard that comment from three, four, maybe five different people that were with us for the weekend, how, how just down to earth, friendly and personable that John is, yet he gets up there and teaches the word like, well, like you guys know. So um, I've got more plans for people, but I can't tell you everything yet. But those that uh, are interested, we are going to do a trip to the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. It's, it's in Northern Kentucky, just south of Cincinnati. The dates are September 6th, 7th, and 8th. Uh, John Chainheit has promised to be there. Uh, Janet, you coming? Sure, I would love to. Okay. I've been so, talking it up. Good, good, good. I guess I got to better find a hotel that we can uh, get reservations for, so I'll work on that. Um, what I want to teach on tonight is basically um, building upon what John Shane Height taught Sunday morning fellowship. We have a local believers that have a great big household, Victorian, um, Ron and Mary Gordon. And when he taught there, he taught on this subject that it really is a continuation of the theme from some of these uh, online fellowships. And it's a theme on suffering. 
Now, I don't, uh, I've never worked towards suffering, <laughs> not once. And I realized after I had uh, John had taught this and it really hit me, and I decided that's what I wanted to work on to expand upon what John taught. And then as I been catching up on the night or the um, online fellowships, I see that Andy Trimble taught three times on suffering. Gabe Heckman, Heckman taught once on suffering and there's still more to teach. So um, this aspect of suffering, like if you want to take your Bibles or your smartphones or whatever you do there, Turn to Philippians 1.29. And uh, I jump around from the King James Version, some Rev and some uh, NIV. So hopefully uh, whatever, when you're reading it in your version, it won't be exactly like what I'm reading, but the gist will be there. And Philippians chapter 1, verse 29 says, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Now, I read this and I say, suffering's not on my radar, right? I didn't get in this thing to suffer. I don't remember Romans 10, 9, and 10 talking much about suffering. <laughs> it says, make him a Lord, right? But it's all over, and the more I look, the more I realize that, that this theme is there, and it's there for a reason. Now, the verse that John taught is in Colossians. So if you want to go to Colossians chapter 1, give you the background. This is Paul, of course writing both Philippians and Colossians, he wrote them from Rome. He was under house arrest. He had been there for about two years, perhaps. He had been arrested in Jerusalem, um, beaten, taken into custody. The, the captain saved him, the chief captain saved him. He spent two years in custody in Caesarea, which we visited. Not much left there, but there was a prison once upon a time. And Paul spent two years there in prison. And then they took him to Rome on a ship. He was shipwrecked along the way. He uh, spent winter in um, an island there. And then in the spring, they finally made it to Rome. He was in, under house arrest. I remember there's no plumbing, no indoor plumbing, but he's chained to somebody 24 hours a day, chained to a Roman guard. So just imagine it's not a comfortable situation, right? Colossians 1.24 says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I am com and I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body, that is the church. Now that's the CSB version, but yours is probably pretty close. He's rejoicing in sufferings, and he's completing in his flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions, and that's the word philippus, philipsis, excuse me. The first word sufferings is pathema, it's extreme, external suffering, misfortune, calamity, evil, affection. Those are from Strong's Concordance. And then the philipsis, that word afflictions, is philips. It's a mental pressure. Pressing together, mental pressure, oppression, affliction, tribulation. It's, it's translated all those different ways. So here he is. He's rejoicing in sufferings, and he's completing in his flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body. That is the church. Now, wait a minute. Didn't Jesus Christ pay the price for all sin? Isn't that what we've learned? Colossians 1.14 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, Jesus Christ paid the price, yet there are times <clears throat> he paid the price for the sin of mankind. But what about this sin that happens upon us, and it's by someone else, and it's an affliction or something that's brought to us from somebody else. They're not confessing their sin. They're not even necessarily born again. What happens? Who pays the price for that sin? You'll see that you do. You do. We do. All right? Um, Christ paid for the sins of mankind, but and someone repents, makes him Lord. He receives remission and forgiveness for those sins reconciliation with God, but how about these unconfessed sins committed against us? We, this verse shows us, we have the privilege of filling up the sufferings of Christ. We take on some of those sufferings, current things that are happening, and we pay the price for that sin that was against us. So now picture a game of pool. Sin is like the cue ball. So that cue ball hits, 
and one ball hits another, hits another, hits another, hits another, hits another. The balls are spread out on the table. The impact of the sin of that cue ball continues to be spread. So you could, uh, John used the analogy of racquetball. I don't play racquetball, so I didn't, I didn't necessarily get that one. But in racquetball, I guess there's walls and, and the ball, when you hit the ball, it can just keep bouncing from wall to wall to wall to wall. And he said, picture that being sin. When someone sins against you and then you turn around and you lash out and you sin against someone else, then that ball keeps bouncing against the walls and the consequences of sin keep going on and on and on, doing further damage. Well, somebody, us, has to take that sin and absorb the impact of it. My wife doesn't like the thought we're trying to figure out the wording. It's not absorb the sin. We're not absorbing the sin, but we're absorbing the impact of the sin. When the sin hits us, it just slides down, okay? Slides to the floor and stops bouncing. So 1 Corinthians 6 if you want to turn there, 1 Corinthians 6. We're familiar with this. This is the NIV in verses 5 through 8. In the NIV, it says, This I say to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother takes another brother to court. And this in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wrong? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers and sisters. And the sin cycle goes on and on. One gets cheated, he cheats somebody else. He cheats somebody else. Why are they angry? Why are these believers angry? It's because they've been sinned against. Undeservedly, perhaps. If they don't absorb or they don't suffer the impact of that sin, it's going to continue to reverberate from one believer to the next, from one person to the next. For instance, your boss gets cut off in traffic on the way to work. The boss comes in, he yells at you. Then you come home, you yell at your wife. Your wife yells at the kids, your kids kick the dog, right? The cycle of sin just keeps going on unless somebody decides to forgive. Someone has to absorb the impact of that sin. Now, in the Old Testament, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 4 here. This is the first use of sin in the Bible. And this Hebrew word, there's, there's a bunch of different words for sin. But this Hebrew word is, uh, it looks like chata off. I don't know. I don't know Hebrew well. It's the first word of sin used in the Bible. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 4. Says, and Abel, this is the NIV, and Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flocks. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do that which is right, sin is crouching at your door. It lies down at the door. It desires to have you. Sin desires to have you, but you must rule over it. That's pretty clear. And in the Old Testament, the word sin is also translated debt. Sin leaves a debt. And it has, this debt has to be help, uh, dealt with. Excuse me. Sin has substance. It's something you can feel, something that can do physical damage. And the emotions burn in your brain. It's like you're building new connections. And, and this is this, uh, just like you build new connections when you learn stuff good, you build connections when you learn stuff bad, and your mind might just keep going back to that sin over and over, just replaying the emotion, replaying the hurt, replaying it, and then it continues to do damage to you. So uh, verse 8 in Genesis. Here, now Cain said to his brother, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel, and he killed him. Cain did not rule over that sin. He let the sin rule over him. Sin has weight. It's a debt. The Hebrew word for forgive is literally means to carry away the sin. Now, Genesis 50, it's a great example. Genesis 50, where this is the story of Joseph and his brothers. Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. First, they were going to kill him, but one of the brothers talked him into selling him into slavery and and. Um, they just told the dad that he was dead, but he really wasn't. So Joseph spent, I'm going to say he was 17 when this happened. He was 
30 years old when this um, incident comes. So that's uh, 13 years he's been, is that right? Yeah, 13 years. Okay, so Genesis 50, verse 17. So shall ye say unto Joseph, forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did evil unto thee. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept and spake with him. So to lift, to, to forgive is the word nasa, it means to lift up, to bear, to carry, to support, to sustain, to endure. It's, it's a physical thing when you're carrying the weight. If you look in Leviticus chapter 16, go ahead and go there. In the Old Testament, there was one day of the year, the Day of Atonement, where the high priest would go into the holiest of holies. And this is, this, this is the account of it in Luke, Leviticus 16, 8 through 10. He, that high priest, is to cast lots for the two goats. He's bringing two goats. One is for the Lord, and they sacrifice it, and the other is for the scapegoat. You've heard that word before. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness. So they, the sins of Israel will be put on the scapegoat and sent off into the wilderness. Somebody's not muted, by the way. I can hear you in the background. So this goat would carry the weight of the sin away from the children of Israel. Now, fast forward to Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 6. These are two different parallel accounts. And in, in one account, the words are used as, as debt. and the other account, the word is used as sin. So sin and debt have um, dual meaning here. Matthew 6, 12, it says, Jesus says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And in that case, uh, we believe that Matthew was, was written in Aramaic or, or Hebrew. And they used the Aramaic word for sin, which was debt. Now, the parallel account in Luke, which had been written in Greek, and forgive us our sins, for we have forgiven every one of us that is indebted to us. So sins and indebt indebtment were linked. Now, Matthew 18, if you want to turn there, Matthew 18, 21. Peter's coming to Jesus, and he says, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith to him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times times seven. And in verse 23, he goes right into the parable, parable of the man, or the king, excuse me, therefore in the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants, and when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. So the parallel here is debt is sin, or sin is debt, right? And so immediately the parable that Jesus gave was about the man that owed 10,000 talents and his Lord forgave him, but then he wouldn't forgive his other servant. When, when you are sinned against, you know that you are owed. You inherently understand that. And someone's got to pay the price, right? Well, in these cases, when we suffer that sin and we absorb the impact of the sin, we pay the price. When someone has sinned against us and we forgive it, we pay the price. That's what that verse in Colossians is going after. Jesus Christ paid the price for that person. Eventually, should that person get born again or look for forgiveness. But when we forgive, we are carrying the burden and carrying the uh, uh, filling up the afflictions of Christ, as that verse says. You suffer. You carry the weight. You suffer the affliction. Give you some examples. So you guys all drive probably, right? Most of you. What do you do when somebody cuts you off in traffic? What's your first thought? Bless you? <laughs> probably not. Okay. This, is, this happened and I was, I was not the one driving. <laughs> um, it's very common that we immediately want to react. Well, that's how road rage happens. And that's how further accidents happen. If you don't literally just forgive when someone's imperfection in their driving. Um, in, uh, this is from the Rev, 1 Peter 3, verse 
six, do not repay evil for evil or verbal abuse for verbal abuse, but on the contrary, bless for this to you, this you were called so that you will inherit a blessing. So yeah, that's what you should do. Somebody blesses you or somebody <laughs> pisses you off out there in public, you bless them. That's what it says. That's a hard thing, but that's what it says. Now here's um, oh, the rest of the verse here. Verses, for whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. And he must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and diligently pursue it. I didn't say this was easy. It's just possible. Okay. Now, uh, other examples. Two years ago, I was driving, minding my own business, going through a green light, and somebody T-boned me. Totally moved my car about 10 foot to the right. So... It totaled my car. I, I missed days of work. I went to physical therapy for nine months. Um, who bore the brunt of that sin? It wasn't the girl that was, she was high and she ran a red light and she, you know, maybe had to pay um, deductible on her collision if she had it, but I had to bear the brunt. You see that? I bore the brunt of that sin. Her sin affected me. So I had to carry that weight. Now, I never saw that woman again. I don't have the chance to ever, you know, say to her face, I forgive you. But I, in my heart, I have to do that. I have to forgive her. I have to carry that weight. All right. Matthew 5 chapter, excuse me, Matthew chapter 5 says, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sakes, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I'll tell you the incident while I'm reading this, because just, just about a month ago, I was in York, Pennsylvania, and I do, I do inspections uh, on other people's work. And, and I was there three days in a row. The first day, I actually witnessed to one of the clients, and it was spontaneous, and it really, I think it really blessed her, and, it, and I think it was inspired of God. The next morning, the very next time I saw the guy that was with me, he's one of the uh, energy auditors from the group, he tore into me exploded on me in in just a really crazy fashion and it was it took me a while to realize why because i had spoken the word the night before he didn't like it didn't say anything but that next morning as soon as i did something that pissed him off he exploded on me now i just shut my mouth i didn't fight back i didn't know where it was coming from i didn't know what was going on but i just i knew enough to just shut up and take it and I did. I absorbed the impact of that sin. And then when the incident was done, it was over. Not another word had to be said. The incident was diffused because I carried the weight. I bore the sin. I did, you know, what little suffering was there, I suffered it. That's Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sakes, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven. So you take your turn, you absorb the impact, you carry the burden. And you forgive the sin for the sake of others. Matthew 5, 44, later on in that chapter, Jesus goes on to say, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them which curse you, and do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. You know, I remember reading these verses and saying, I don't understand. Well, I think I understand better now. I think I'm beginning to see just why that is filling up the sins, right? Taking, taking on sins that are directed at us, forgiving them, carrying the weight, diffusing the impact. Uh, 1 Peter 2, if you want to go there, 1 Peter 2, verses 20 through 23. This is from the NIV. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and enduring it? Now, that, that would be suffering for reaping what you sow. And that's not the kind of suffering we're talking about here. You know, there's a lot of that going on. You're suffering. You're in jail because you robbed a bank, for instance. Not none of you guys, hopefully. 
but that's suffering for doing evil, right? And, and there's plenty of that in life. So, but this is not what we're talking about. How is it, excuse me, but if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, there's, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Verse 22, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Now, if you um, go to that Colossians 1.24 in the Rev, these are from John's notes in the commentary of Colossians 1.24, and I'll read you some selective passages here. When a person sins against another, from God's viewpoint, it is the person who has sinned who owes the debt, but in real life, often the sinner either cannot pay the cost of sin or he refuses to pay it. The financial cost of that sin is the easy part to pay, but even that is seldom completely paid for, for one to whom has sinned. For example, if a woman's purse is stolen and it costs her hundreds of dollars and dozens of hours to replace everything, who pays for that sin? If a man is falsely accused of murder and he's put in prison, it takes him years to prove his incident, innocence, and rebuild his life. Who pays for that sin? If a little girl crossing the road is hit by a drunk driver and is crippled for life, who pays for that sin? In real life, it's the people that are sinned against who regularly have to bear to suffer the mental, the physical, the emotional, and the financial cost for that sin. This is still John's commentary. At the most fundamental level, sin is always paid for by forgiveness. When we were unsaved, we were all sinners and incurred the debt that our sin created. But Jesus paid for our sin by forgiving us and dying in our place. But in our day-to-day -day life, people sin against us. And when it comes to those sins, we have the opportunity to be like Christ. When a person sins against us and technically owes us the debt of sin, we can pay the debt by forgiving them. Our paying the debt for someone else's sin by forgiving them doesn't pay for their salvation, but it keeps the sin from causing us to sin, us to sin, by being angry, bitter, seeding, seeking revenge, etc. And thus, we add to the sin cycle. We keep the sin cycle going, right? How can we stop this sin cycle? It stops when some godly person like Paul decides to complete the thing that is lacking and pays for the sin by forgiving it. In Paul's case, he suffered a lot and he could have passed that sin along by being angry, bitter, and nasty to the people around him rather than paying for it by forgiving it. When a person forgives, he's like Paul who said he was taking my turn to complete in my flesh the things which are lacking of the afflictions of Christ. So Colossians 1.24, again, if you go back to that verse, the idea of taking our turn to complete the afflictions of Christ, it may be new, and it's new to me, to many people, since it's not often taught from that perspective, but the realization that we have to pay for the sins people commit against us is not new. Everyone is aware of it. It's safe to say that everyone knows when they're sinned against that someone's got to pay for it. You just inherently know. And, and it's hard to say that guy's going to get away with it. Like he sinned against me and I forgive him, but now he gets away with it, right? That's what you may be telling yourself, but he's not going to get away with it. And we don't want to have the attitude that, you know, he's going to pay at judgment day and burn. We would love to see that guy repent and have uh, forgiveness of sins, just like we've received, right? But, the antidote to our being angry and bitter when the word, world treats us badly is to be totally willing to, to be like Christ, to suffer the sins of others so that the cycle of sin ends at our door. Look at 1 Peter 2, verse 21. For you were called to this because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. You see that theme of suffering throughout the epistles, the church epistles and the general epistles. When he was verbally abused, he did not abuse in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he committed himself to the one who judges 
righteously. And in 1 Peter 4, 13, but rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's suffering that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. So if we can genuinely love others and forgive, we keep in mind that we will be rewarded for our forgiving and the injustices done to us. Then we can do what this says in Colossians 1.24, and then we can also rejoice in that suffering. So, amen.